Well, hello, welcome to our at the table service tonight on this, the last day of June. How did that happen? We are grateful to be together for worship in this way on the last Sunday of June, and I'm grateful to see all of you, and especially also if you're watching a recording of us, we welcome you, and we're grateful we can gather and worship in this virtual way. Uh, know that you're always welcome to join us live when we have our Zoom services. Feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is frank at wbpresbyterian.org, and I'll be more than happy to share with you the Zoom link. Um, we had last week, we weren't on Zoom. We were in person at the church and we had a lovely poetry and praise service. Uh, and we're going to be having another one uh, at the end of the month uh, in July. So we'll remind you more about that uh, next Sunday and in, in the weeks to come. Um, and just a reminder, next Sunday on July 7th, we will we'll have a service on Zoom like we are tonight, but we'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, so be sure next Sunday when we gather, feel free to have your forms of bread and juice um, or wine, whatever is whatever works for you uh, as we celebrate the communion as a part of our service next week. Um, the other thing I'll just mention real quick is we're going to have a, a special evening on Saturday, July 13th. Uh, it's a gala for Haiti. Uh, it's starting at five o'clock. Um, our own Van Anthony Hall is going to be sharing his gift of music with us as a part of that. And it's a fundraiser and a dinner that will be uh, celebrating our partnership with Yavre Jair Children's Foundation and um, Shedlin and Shedwin are both going to be with us. Uh, Shedlin uh, Justinville, as well as his son Shedwins, is going to be with us that evening. So it'll be a wonderful evening. We hope you can join us and you can find information about it on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, please plan to come and, and share in that evening of fun and fellowship and a chance to raise funds to help in that important ministry in Haiti. Let us begin our worship. I will put up here. Okay, give me a second. I lost one thing, so I'll put it back up here. Participants can now see your application. You are screen sharing. You have started screen share. So I will apologize again that our friend AI is with us and is gonna be telling you every time I share the screen or do things. So we will just mark him as an attendant in our service this evening. Hopefully by next week, Frank will have figured out how to turn that off. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. Welcome one another in Jesus' name, for Christ is truly present among us. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The mercies of God never come to an end. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Now we live by the Spirit of God. Ben Anthony, I'll invite you to Introduce our opening song for us. Hey Amen. Just a little bit of opening song trivia. Uh, there was a song I did titled Christ Has Set Me Free that would have fit so perfectly. I offered it last Sunday, and the uh, editing gods didn't allow me to get a clip of that to, to use, but it's I will bring that back because uh, it's so appropriate. Uh, that being said, we are offering God of All praise team singing by Scott Reed and Paul Taylor. Wonderful. Thanks. Oceans cry out and the stars declare who you are, who you are. All of the splendors of heaven unveil who you are, who you are.
Our scripture tonight is from the fifth chapter of Mark, which is 21 through 43. I invite you to hear God's word to us this evening. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and, when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed Jesus and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before Jesus, and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid. Only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. When Jesus entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, Jesus said to her, Talatha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give the little girl something to eat. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's word this day. What do you pray for? You pray for a new job for you or your friend or a family member? Do you pray for improved health for yourself or someone you love? Do you pray for a sense of direction or purpose for a child who is struggling with what to do next in their life? Do you pray for an end to violence in our neighborhood, our city, our nation, our world? This past week, I had been praying for many things. I held in prayer the youth and adults that were serving in mission on our behalf in Wilmington. I prayed that they would stay safe and well in what has been awful, awful heat. I asked God to watch over me as I drove up to Washington, D.C. on Tuesday and Wednesday to get a bed frame and a mattress from Erin, our daughter, and that I would survive one last trip driving to and through D.C. I held in prayer family, friends, and church members who have been struggling mightily with illness. I prayed for our community and our country 
as we face so many monumental issues. I prayed that leaders will seek the good of the whole, not what is best for them. And I prayed for Mary Todd and Camden Ferguson as they were married yesterday at Western Boulevard and I as they begin their new life together as a married couple. Several years ago, a couple of our, who are close friends of ours, announced that they were expecting their first child. And this couple had struggled mightily with fertility for many years. And eventually they used IVF as their last option to hopefully conceive. And when I got their email many years ago that said that they were pregnant, it, I literally cried. It brought tears to my eyes. And I remember praying fervently for them in the months that followed. And I was grateful that all went smoothly as they welcomed their only child into the world some eight years ago. In the midst of so many changes that are taking place in our society and our community, I'm constantly praying for wisdom, for guidance, for discernment, both as a pastor and as an individual Christian. Sometimes as I'm tackling that to-do list or planning for the future or addressing whatever the latest crisis might be, I find myself searching for affirmation, asking God for direction, wondering if I need to take a different track. It seems a lot of the prayers I offer for myself always include, God, am I on the right path here? Maybe your prayers are similar to mine, or maybe they include other areas of petition. Often our prayers will fall into one of two categories, either for ourselves or for others. Because we are in relationship with family, with friends, strangers, and other human beings, we pray for their health, their safety, their security, their well-being. Because we are individually children of God, we pray for our health, our safety, our security, and well-being. We pray to God because we believe God listens to us acts on our behalf, and brings wholeness and healing where otherwise there is brokenness and pain. We're often motivated to pray because we are uncertain of what else we should do, and we seek divine intervention in what seems to be a hopeless situation. The passage we've heard this evening shares the story of two individuals who are seeking divine intervention in what appears to be a hopeless situation. While neither of these healing stories involve prayer per se, they certainly relate to our human desire to call on God to act in a restorative way. Interestingly enough, each of these people represent the earlier distinctions that we mentioned about who we pray for. Jairus is seeking healing for his daughter, and a woman is seeking healing for her 12 years of suffering from hemorrhages. And in both of these cases, Jesus does not turn them away, but offers to them words of hope. Do not fear, only believe. It's interesting how one healing interrupts the other healing in this passage. We begin with Jesus responding to Jairus' plea to come and heal his daughter who's critically ill. As he's walking with the crowds of people to Jairus' house, the woman who has suffered from hemorrhages desperately seeks Jesus' healing touch. Her hand touches his garment, and that simple action heals her of her affliction. And I love Jesus's reaction. It reminds me of a parent who knows something has happened with a child. Who touched, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? And note that the woman doesn't disappear into the crowd. She doesn't retreat into anonymity. She steps forward, albeit in fear and trembling, 
and admits to Jesus the whole truth. Perhaps Jesus's affirmation is not only for her faith, but also for her courage and her honesty. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. By the time Jesus has finished his conversation and interaction with the woman, we learn that Jairus' daughter has run out of time. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? That would be the normal human response, wouldn't it? It's clear that the illness has run its course. There's no need to bother this great man of God any further. He can't do anything for the little girl now. Let him go and begin the grieving process for your child. But Jesus will not accept what the world sees. And he turns that perspective on its head with God's grace. He tells them the child is not dead, but is sleeping. The world doesn't see that and laughs in his face. Jesus sends out the crowd and with Jairus and his wife stands beside the girl's bed. He takes her hand, says, little girl, get up. And she promptly stands up and walks around the room. Jairus's prayers had been answered. And Jesus shows the world that only God will have the final word. And yet, how do we react when our prayers to God don't turn out as well as the woman or Jairus? How is our faith shaken when all we see is continued violence and poverty and hopelessness around us? How are we supposed to approach not only prayer, but also our mission into the world if things don't appear to be heading in the way we want them to? A Presbyterian pastor writes, I have a friend, a man of deep faith, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when he was still in his 50s. He and his wife prayed that he might be healed. 20 years later, he is in the last debilitating stages of that disease. Nevertheless, he once told me that his prayers had been answered. He said in all sincerity, I have been healed, not of Parkinson's disease, but I have been healed of my fear of Parkinson's disease. These two biblical healing stories from Mark, in which people turn to Jesus for healing, will raise the question, does prayer work? Well, if we mean by this, do you get what you pray for? The honest answer will be sometimes, but not always. Pray as they may, we all know that all prayers are not answered as we pray them. It may be helpful to remember that prayers for healing are not simply utilitarian. That is to say, prayer is not simply a matter of bending the vector of divine will toward my will my needs, my hopes. More profoundly, to ask something of God is to edge into deeper relationship with God. God's mind may or may not be changed, but I, my mind and my heart, I may be changed. The phrase that speaks to me most deeply out of this passage is Jesus' words to Jairus when he learns that his daughter has already died. Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. When our prayers are not seemingly answered, we can fall into fear. When it feels like hope has gone, we can drown in anxiety. 
when the troubles of this world seem to be insurmountable, we might decide enough's enough and refuse to reach out to help, to love, to serve. And in those moments, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. Do not allow fear to take over your worldview. Do not fear what is unknown. Do not fear what the world tells you to fear. Believe. Believe that you can draw closer to God through your prayer life. Believe that your heart and mind can be changed by God's grace. Believe that the world does not have the final word. Only God has the final word. That final word also relates to justice and righteousness, something we often pray for, but feel is miles and miles away. Willie Duane Francois III reminds us that out of this story also comes the reminder that we can take steps of risk and faith and God will act accordingly. Francois writes, There's an irony in this miracle story. The unclean woman interrupts a person who represents her exclusion, Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. On the way to his estate, where his daughter teeters on the edges of sickness and death, Jairus observes the healing consequences of the woman's rebellious reach, bodily wholeness, and emotional security. Because of her rebellious reach, the unclean woman claims dignity and wholeness and a future, all in the presence of a religious elite. Rosa Parks had a rebellious and resilient reach. The civil rights era luminary sparked a campaign in Alabama that ricocheted across the United States. In 1943, James Blake, a white bus driver in Montgomery, ejected Parks from a bus after she refused to re-enter through the rear of the bus. Rather than comply with segregationist logic, she defiantly opted to wait in the rain for the next bus to arrive. Twelve years later, Parks boarded another Montgomery public bus and encountered the same driver, who told her to relocate to the back of the bus to accommodate a white passenger. In what became known as Park's cardinal act of resistance, she refused, and Blake called the police, leading to her arrest and igniting the Montgomery boy bus boycott. 381 days of collective resistance to Jim Crow economics. After the United States Supreme Court ruled against bus, bus segregation and the boycott ended, Blake's bus intersected with Parks itinerary for a third time. Parks boarded an integrated public bus to pose for media coverage of the landmark decision. And in a tone of poetic justice, the same bus driver who left her in the rain in 1943 and instigated her arrest in 1955, had to drive her as she legally sat in the front of the bus. As with the unnamed woman in the fifth chapter of Mark, Rosa Parks' resilience placed her progress on display in the presence of a custodian of the status quo. To the man who does not know what God still wants him to do, 
after experiencing so much physical adversity. Do not fear, only believe. To the teenager who is struggling with their identity and what might come next in their life, do not fear, only believe. To the church that is faced with ministering to a community that is constantly changing, yet has incredible potential. Do not fear, only believe. And to the woman who takes a step of resilient faith, all the while knowing the risks involved, do not fear, only believe. As we live out our calling to be disciples of the one who heals the body, mind, and soul, May we always remain open to whatever God may say to us. And through our worship, our prayers, and our discipleship, may we never allow fear to have the last word. May we trust and believe in the one who heals, who saves, and who redeems us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response to God's word, I'd invite us to declare our faith, and tonight we will... Participants can now see your application. You are screen sharing. You have started screen share. I was going to say that. Let's declare our faith using these words from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. We come now to a time when we lift up our prayers for ourselves, for others, and for our world. And I thought tonight for our prayers, let us each, as we have a petition to share, to just simply unmute ourselves and share it and then we invite us to, if you, whoever says that, to simply say the phrase, Lord, in your mercy, and we all respond, hear our prayer. And then at the end, I will collect us together and we'll say together the Lord's Prayer. I would invite us to remember tonight Mac Winslow's father, Jim, who suffered a stroke on Friday and is a patient at Duke University Hospital in Durham. And Mac shared with me this afternoon that he's doing better. That they've had good signs of, of, they're more optimistic, he said, than they were yesterday. So we are grateful for that, but we ask for God's healing touch and, and comfort to be with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Tracy Vaughn this morning shared with us that a dear friend of hers, who she knew from her de years um, serving at Montreat, her name was Elizabeth Alexander, died yesterday um, after a 20 month battle with colon cancer. Elizabeth um, was in her late 30s. Um, she leaves behind a husband and three young children and a service to celebrate her life will take place tomorrow. So we lift up the family of Elizabeth Alexander and ask for God to be present in their time of loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. My cousin Vaughn Seals 
grandson who had the traumatic brain injury after a motorcycle accident. Well, Von, Von Seal let everyone know some very wonderful news that Zach has now been stabilized enough in his you know, breathing and everything that he has been able to be transferred to the home of his mother and she and her husband are going to be caring for Zach in their home now so he doesn't have to be in a long-term care facility in a, another state. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Jack Gebby lifts up a gratitude prayer of gratitude that both his son um, David and his and David's wife Debbie, um, both who have had medical um, issues and, and concerns, are both getting good signs and improvement. And he gives thanks for that. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Mm -hmm. We'd like to thank the congregation for all the prayers for Terrell. He's out of the hospital and uh, his blood got thinned. That's one of the things he was in there for, multiple things, but that was one of the things that caused the valve he had put in in December not to work. So they got his blood thin, but he was at the doctor Friday and it's too thin. So now they've got to reduce the thinning mm -hmm medicine but he's much bet much much better and we thank everyone for their prayers lord in your mercy hear our prayers. we remember the father uh of david rutherford david and angie rutherford who are recently new members of our church david's father's name is james um he's now under hospice care um and just recently turned, I think, 84 years old. And so our prayers surround him and David and their family as they care for him in these days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Gracious and loving God, we know we can come to you anytime, any place, and turn to you in prayer to lean deeper into our relationship with you. Thank you for this gift, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that helps us stay connected to you and to one another. Hear all of these that we have named out loud, others whom you know through the, our hearts and minds. And be with all in this world who are hurting, who are lonely, who live in the shadow of violence, who live in the shadow of poverty and exclusion. May we, in whatever way possible, offer glimmers of hope, lights of love, that help all of your children know that they are loved by you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. AI is going to make one more announcement. So we'll wait and get that out of the way. Participants can now see your application. You are screen sharing. You have started screen share. I promise by next week, I'll try to turn that off. Van, I'll let you introduce our closing song. Amen. <laughs> uh, 
our praise team is going to leave you with God Will Make a Way by Don Moore. Go in peace. Amen. That is a wonderful reminder to all of us that God will make a way. It may not always be the way we anticipate or maybe thought it should be, but God is there. God's never leaving us, and God will always be beside us on the way that we are going. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today, tomorrow, and all of your days. Amen. Great to see all of you. Hope you have a good week. Stay cool. Have a good week. Thank you. It's good Have to be a good with week, you. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.